Okay, so tonight we are here to talk about the IFCO Alum Scholarship Program, um, which is a joint collaborative um, program offered by the Ministry of Health in Cuba um, and administered through IFCO Passage for Peace based in New York. And my name is Dr. Samir Adri. Some of you may already know me. I am the Elam uh, Scholarship Program Coordinator. Um, and my teammate co-worker is Ms. Angie Landing, who is currently the social media coordinator, but she definitely wears several hats, um, like all of us in the IFCO family, um, in assisting to coordinate this project. So for tonight, um, the agenda, and what we're gonna talk about essentially to warm us up before um, we talk about this application process itself is a brief overview of the Cuban healthcare system and its achievements in a global context. Um, then the mission and vision of ELAM, um, how it came about, how this specific scholarship for US citizens also came about, and life as an ELAM student, comparing and contrasting it to a, a US medical student's journey in a way. Um, and then we talk about the application process for US citizens and some question and answer at the end. Obviously the time that is set on these, it's gonna be a little bit, you know, we'll, we'll try to stay within that, that time slot, but just be ready because it is a lot of content, but that is very intentional because um, we just can't offer you details about this scholarship without also taking the opportunity to educate, um, especially because this is about, um, this is about Elam. And so we want to make sure that Elam, being that it's in Cuba, we give a full education of um, what Cuba is about and its, it's standing in history and how we've come to this very point. So Cuba is known for a long history of uh, medical internationalism. Um, and that is what Elam's come at the tail end of of that medical internationalism, that history of internationalism, helping people all over the world. Um, and it's a, a con continuity of that medical internationalism. So um, Cuba is an island nation neighboring the United States about 90 miles away from Miami. It is home to about 11 million people and it is a healthcare superpower. Uh, despite spending less on healthcare than many of its developed counterparts, especially being the United States. Um, guiding words for tonight uh, is a quote by uh, the Apostol de Cuba, the, the, one of the great forefathers in Cuban history, Jose Martí. He says, un hombre genuino llega a las raíces. Ser radical no es más que eso, ir a la raíz. So what that means is a genuine uh, man arrives at the roots. Um, to, to be radical is no more than that, is to go to the root. Um, so these are the guiding words, be, especially because um, the form of medical help that Cuba has offered has not been a band-aid on the problem. It has always sought to really uh, find true and lasting solutions to the healthcare mismanagement and inequities that we find in the world. Um, and so it, for that reason, it is a radical and very revolutionary approach. So that is why I chose this quote um, by Jose Marti to guide the discussion and uh, information that I'm going to give you all today. Like Understanding the Cuban healthcare system. So uh, there are three instances in which we tried, we use historically to understand the Cuban healthcare system. Before the revolution, um, by the time the socialist revolution of Comandante Fidel Castro and the Cuban people triumphed in 1959, Approximately 3,000 physicians fled Cuba, mostly to the United States, while another 3,000 stayed on the island. Um, there was an absence of a public health plan. All hospitals were centered in the cities, and every practitioner at that time was charging patients. So they had very much like uh, a system like what we know today, which is a pay-for-care uh, system, and it created serious disadvantages for the majority of the Cuban population um, before the revolution. Most people uh, had not seen medical doctors unless they could afford it. 
um, and that was a small fraction of the population that could truly afford it. And it was, again, uh, concentrated in urban areas. Then after 1959, uh, even though uh, over 40% over of the medical personnel had left the island uh, by the time of the triumphs of the revolution, those who stayed uh, took on the arduous task of not only uh, forming new doctors and building uh, and rebuilding the medical infrastructure, but also um, teaching and training uh, the nurses as well and all other allied health workers. So um, this created for a very, very robust uh, primary health care system um, that I'll explain, but started with first the construction of polyclinics that were uh, community-based, um, that would centralize most of the healthcare that people needed in all provinces. Um, Cuba is split up into provinces, not states. And so all provinces would now have um, cities that had polyclinics where people could uh, receive care. Uh, and it was a universal, uh, free and accessible healthcare plan. Um, in 1976, the Cuban Constitution re is revised and incorporates the guarantee to health protection and care. Um, this care would be free and universally accessible, focusing on prevention and health promotion and, and education. This is very important, um, and that date is also important because historically, it also comes, uh, although Cuba had already set its eyes on making health a human right on the island uh, once the, tr the revolution triumphed, uh, during this time was Cuba's uh, recommitment to that plan by joining, you know, joining forces with the rest of the world at the Ama'ata conference, um, where it was designed that primary health care would be the cornerstone of making sure that uh, human beings all over the world would actually have care, um, health care. And so with that, Cuba continued its work um, in developing its plan as a nation. And as the polyclinic plan grew stronger and more solidified in its population, uh, they later also created in 1984 the Family Doctor and Nurse Program, uh, which is one of the bedrocks of um, primary care as it is right now in Cuba, because it has, it places a doctor and nurse uh, in every neighborhood. Uh, this doctor and nurse uh, team is responsible for uh, protecting and preserving the health of approximately 1,000 to 1,500 patients. So people, these, these doctors and nurses typically live, uh, most of them right above the, their medical consult office and the neighbors um, th that they take care of know them um, and know that you know, they're always there. And it's not a matter of just sitting in the office and having uh, received patients, but rather also going into their homes and getting to know their total environment and how that, uh, uh, how that affects their health. So this doctor and nurse program uh, took Cuban healthcare to another level. Um, you know, it, it just brought healthcare much closer to home and it made it made it really, really more of a a connecting project as well because people were connecting with people that they knew and that they trusted because they were neighbors, um, not random people just coming into the neighborhood and, and taking care of them. Um, but the family doctor and nurse program is how Cuba uses um, these small cells in each neighborhood to build data, collect data, to then assess what the general situation of health is, not only for a community, but in the city and in the province, and then as a country altogether. So it's a very vital component of, um, of its healthcare plan. Um, and again, you don't need appointments or, or insurance or anything. You just show up uh, when you need uh, to see the doctor. Um, you may have to be in a line for a little bit, but the doctor is there um, to attend to you. And if you can't make it there, you send a family member or a neighbor to alert the, the doctor or nurse, they will also come to you. Um, that's also been especially important, um, giving 
the situation we find ourselves in with this pandemic. So these these elements of Cuban healthcare system um, are, you know, while they're that's happening on the island, from the very beginning of the triumph of the revolution, Cuba makes it its priority to send uh, its medical personnel and teachers and and other professionals uh, throughout the world to help in uh, in situations of uh, disaster. Um, and this is a timeline of just a few of those places that. Uh, Cuban doctors, nurses, teachers, um, athletic trainers, all sorts of professionals have been to post um, disasters in Chile when there was an earthquake. This was almost immediately after um, the triumph of the revolution in 1960. Um, this earthquake devastated Chile and already uh, Cuba was sending doctors before it had uh, created its own infrastructure. Then in Algeria, which was a very important moment in the, the history of African liberation movements. Um, at that time, historically, uh, Cuba sent doctors there. Guinea-Bissau, Angola, uh, it, in the case of the Chernobyl victims, tr uh, Cuba treated thousands of children who were affected from the Chernobyl nuclear disaster uh, in Cuba. In 1990, Iran uh, Cuba sent doctors uh, after the hurricane Mitch and George in 1998, uh, which gave way to the rise of this special school called the Latin American School of Medicine. Um, and then later on after that, um, in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan, in Haiti after the earthquake, um, in the Ebola crisis, uh, sending doctors to Guinea, uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and of course in this 2020 uh, COVID pandemic, when it started, uh, Cuba also sent many, many doctors all over the world um, to different countries um, that called on it for help. So Cuba sees its its work, um, its medical diplomacy, as some people put it, uh, not just as disaster tourism. It's not a way to make a buck or create some kind of um, false charity presence um, in countries that have been devastated by trauma, uh, by serious um, disasters, right? So um, between 1963 and 2004, Cuba was involved in the creation of nine medical faculties, um, even in, in Yemen, in Guyana, Ethiopia, Guinea-Bissau, Uganda, Ghana, Gambia, Equatorial Guinea, and Haiti, um, and others. And this is because while they were sending their personnel to help in places, they also built these faculties to teach and train um, the natives um, of those countries to build gl a global healthcare infrastructure. Because um, again, it's not about putting a Band-Aid on an issue. It's really about um, creating solutions, long lasting solutions. So some of the medical achievements, this is a very, very abbreviated list of uh, medical achievements for Cuba. Um, and it's an ongoing um, list of, of achievements. Uh, it's, it's a historic time to live in and to know about Cuba's uh, medical prowess. Um, but one of the greatest things, uh, speaking in this time where, you know, vaccines are a big thing, uh, polio was eradicated in, uh, in Cuba in 1963 because Cuba was one of the first countries in the world that took on a massive polio campaign, a vaccination campaign. And within a few years, there they had little to no cases reported on the island. And that was it, that was and is tremendous considering how polio really affected uh, many, many people in the world, um, even when there was a vaccine and, and vaccines hadn't been able to get to the people who needed them most. Cuba took it on seriously and uh, to this day, because even this coming week is um, the, the this year's polio vaccination campaign um, in the country. Uh, so it's an ongoing process for them and they take um, preventative health care um, very seriously and vaccination is one of those aspects of preventative health care that is serious. Um, so because of that, they've been able to eradicate um, Pertussis, diphtheria, mumps, measles, uh, 
infectious diseases that unfortunately we still see even here in a developed country um, because some people don't get vaccinated. Um, and, and definitely in many parts of the world because they don't have access to these life-saving vaccines. Um, Cuba has the lowest infant mortality in the Americas. Um, at, at the moment, it stands at four in every thousand live births. That's huge. Um, then there's also the first lung cancer vaccine being created in the world in Cuba. And that is a project that is um, has been for a few years uh, taken on in con in collaboration with Roswell Institute in Buffalo, New York, because this is a vaccine that when patients who have uh, lung cancer are injected with it, shrinks the cancer over time. Uh, and it's amazing. Um, and why would Cuba invest in something like this? Because unfortunately, lung cancer was one of the prevailing causes of death in Cuba. And so what did they they guide their biotechnological sector to do, to find a cure, to find a way to reduce um, mortality from lung cancer. And this was this was th what they came up with. So uh, we know that it's a vaccine that is needed everywhere in the world, um, if not only in the United States, certainly everywhere. Um, and it's good to know um, that an institute like Roswell is uh, collaborating so that one day we all can also benefit um, from this wonderful vaccine. Um, they also have uh, a very phenomenal treatment for uh, di diabetic um, foot ulcers uh, to prevent amputation. It's called Herbaprot. And it is really, really amazing to see that, you know, they give these treatments to patients who are most vulnerable, who are diabetic and are showing signs of uh, necrosis and they in inject and treat these patients with Herbaprot so that amputation doesn't end up being, you know, a factor in their life and doesn't end up uh, creating uh, a new disability in their life. And so, again, it's about prevention. So that's an amazing treatment um, that it has has reached many countries in the world, unfortunately, has not reached the United States uh, because of the economic and criminal blockade that we have against Cuba. Uh, the United States citizens don't have access to Herbert Pratt because we're too busy uh, making economic war with Cuba. Um, and also another thing is the elimination of uh, mother to child transmission of, of HIV and AIDS um, was first done in Cuba in 2015. And it's, it's amazing um, to be able to be in a system, study in a system that has all these kind of medical accolades. And so that brings us to the Latin American School of Medicine. How, sorry for the typo, how, <laughs> unbelievable. Um, how did this amazing school come to be? Um, the history of this school, uh, number one, it's a former naval base that was repurposed into a medical school. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, it came about after um, the hurricane, George, hurricanes Georges and Mitch devastated um, part of Central America and the Caribbean. Um, and so in sending personnel, medical personnel, uh, to those devastated countries and seeing uh, what all was at hand, uh, Comandante and Jefe Fidel Castro decided to make uh, an even more profound um, solution to the problem because he saw that these areas were not only devastated by the hurricane, uh, but devastated by the hurricane of poverty. And what better gift than to train the sons and daughters of these nations to take care of their own people, to be doctors and, um, and nurses and take care of their own uh, versus having to only send Cuban doctors uh, and nurses for a temporary time um, and then have to leave and leave um, these nations in in the equal, the same crisis that they were previously in. So the mission and vision of Elam is to train doctors of science and conscience. Um, Fidel Castro said that what we want from the Latin American School of Medicine is for students from our sister nations to become imbued with the same doctrine in which our own doctors are educated, with that total devotion to their noble future profession. For a doctor is like a shepherd, a priest, a missionary, a crusader for the people's health and physical and mental well-being. 
And so, as I mentioned before, um, came about this beautiful school um, that initially uh, was an offer of 5,000 scholarships to um, students from Honduras, from um, Dominican Republic, from Haiti, and Guatemala. Uh, those were the, the first countries that were offered this scholarship. Uh, but then shortly after this scholarship was offered um, to youths from those countries, many countries appealed uh, to Cuba for the scholarship to be extended to their, their children as well. Um, and so this school, which the name is uh, based on the fact that it was initially uh, created to train Latin American um, students, became not just a Latin American school, but a truly international school um, in its in, in full capacity. And how did the U.S. students become part of the Elam story? Well, in June of 2000, Representative Benny Thompson um, from Mississippi on an IFCO tour of the school for members of the Congressional Black Caucus remarked that there were large areas in his district in Mississippi Delta that didn't have a single physician either. Um, and Comandante Fidel Castro immediately thought of a way to help rectify this, the situation. So in his speech um, on September 8, 2000, at uh, New York City's Riverside Church, uh, the former president made an offer. Um, he said, we are prepared to grant a number of scholarships to poor youth who cannot afford to pay the $200,000 it costs to get a medical degree in the United States. Uh, and in 2000, IFCO, Passage for Peace, uh, was designated as the only institution in the U.S. to facilitate uh, this scholarship for U.S. citizens. Um, and the first group of U.S. Uh, students that attended ELAM uh, went in August of 2001. So that is how the United States came to benefit um, from this amazing institution uh, in, in Cuba. And it is a one of a kind experience. This is a place where you get such a unique educational experience because you are well-rounded. Um, you become well-rounded in what they teach you. And um, it's based in collaborative learning, not the competitive um, over-competitive uh, environment that most of us have studied in, in the United States um, and elsewhere in the world. Uh, it's a holistic education from start to finish. You learn about the biopsychosocial model, which emphasizes seeing your patient as a whole person. Um, in addition, you earn um, a lot of knowledge uh, in community medicine and public health education. Um, it's well integrated into everything that you're learning, becomes part and par parcel of it. And so you're able to see how all these different sectors are really needed to, to um, give quality healthcare to a population. Um, the emphasis of ELAM training is based on the strengths of the Cuban healthcare system, which is primary care and community medicine. Um, and you basically become a public health expert uh, once you finish the program because, again, it's a part, it's built into the curriculum. And the school is an amazing uh, experience because it boasts uh, representatives from over 120 countries. You go to school with uh, students from over 120 countries. Um, and of course, these countries have fluctuated over time. Initially, like I said, it was just uh, mostly Latin American countries, and then it grew. Um, and as it grew, um, it has graduated over 30,000 um, physicians from all over the world. And um, it typically has a student body of about um, 10 to 12,000 on the island because it is a, a seven-year program. Um, you become not only enriched culturally through the people that you go to school with and that you learn with, um, and also uh, Cuba in itself being uh, a very culturally rich place to, to grow up in to, and to learn in, um, but you also become bilingual. Um, and it's, it's priceless, the experience is priceless. 
So daily life as an ELOM student, um, this is split into, um, our education is split into preclinical years and clinical years. Um, preclinical years are your pre-med through your second year, which pre-med, why? Because your first year there is a preliminary year where you are taught Spanish in the first six months. Um, and then the remaining months you are put into classes that are pre-med basic sciences, um, but all in Spanish. Again, to reinforce the Spanish that you've learned, but also to make you get used to medical terminology in Spanish, which is not too different from English, but um, all the same, this is the foundation that you would use to then study your subsequent years um, in Cuba. So everything is in Spanish. Uh, there's not one, I mean, there are teachers who can speak English, but they are not going to teach you anything <laughs> in English. So it is an incubator uh, for you to learn the language and master it. Um, a typical day of of a student in a preclinical year is full of lectures and labs um, from medical sciences. From 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., you have evaluations on a weekly basis. These are written and oral evaluations. Um, and why is that? Because it's a subjective and an objective way of, of evaluating students. Um, it also gives you the opportunity to build that capacity of explaining and teaching um, concepts, medical concepts and ideas um, to yourself, to your peers, and um, it's that's how the system is is made. They are there are additional courses like um, physical education, history and medicine. Um, intro to um, Medicina General Integral is co comprehensive general medicine, um, which is a unique uh, version of family medicine, unique to Cuba, because it's way much more than just family medicine. It adds the public health part and and so much other components to it. Then uh, you during that time, you also have weekly visits to polyclinics and consultorios. Uh, consultorios are the medical offices where the doctor and nurse, the family doctor and nurse are uh, located in each neighborhood. Then you're introduced to on-call shifts at polyclinics. Uh, these on-call shifts are in the beginning years, very short, typically uh, a few hours on the weekends for you to go into the emergency uh, room section of the polyclinic and um, shadow, observe doctors and nurses as they take care of um, patients, but also for you to start applying the skills that you're taught from day one, um, from your in your first year. Uh, you practice those during your on-call shifts at the polyclinics, um, giving injections, all the nursing um, nursing procedures are taught to us. So from, from that time, we're supposed to practice um, them and most of these polyclinics are teaching polyclinics. So the patients know that they're coming and they're gonna be attended to possibly by a student to resolve whatever issue they have. Uh, of course, all within the supervision of the nurses and doctors uh, on shift. Then there are study halls and classrooms and library after hours, um, student apprenticeships in different academic departments. Um, you find different events being organized by university extracurricular department like dance classes, arts and plastics, social political events uh, hosted by de different delegations, movie screenings, cultural galas. There are marches like May Day March, the Day of uh, Latin American Medicine, uh, Medical Student Day, Jose Marti's birthday. Um, those are just some of the examples of the marches that are massive, massive marches uh, in involving not just students from the medical school, but students from all over the city, as well as workers. Um, so those are very impactful moments to participate in as well. Um, and there's also Student Research Day uh, on a school level, provincial level, um, and a national level. And so there are quite a bit of things to do. Um, and again, you hear me mention delegations. Um, it's because there are so many countries that are uh, represented at the school that we are grouped as delegations, as um, some of what you may call as cohorts. Uh, we are grouped as delegations by country. Our teachers typically know us um, by the country that we come from. Um, so that's, if you hear me say delegations, that's what that is in reference to. Uh, clinical years, which are your third through your 
sixth year of training are also all taught in Spanish. And this is where you leave the Elam uh, Naval Base Campus to be placed in hospitals um, throughout the city of Havana. In the case of in the case of U.S. students, we are at one teaching hospital in Havana. Uh, that's where we're placed. But our comrades from other countries are placed in hospitals all over the country in different provinces. So typically, we stay together um, with our our friends from all over until um, the end of second year. So when third year starts, you're split off and you may meet some of your friends from before, but again, because everybody has been split all over the country, many times you may not see each other again until graduation day, um, unless you visit each other uh, in provinces like some of us did. So rotations are at teaching hospitals, um, and this is where you get all your different specialties, in internal medicine, ob surgery, peds, um, Medicina General in Tagal again, um, continuing that study, public health, urology, ophthalmology. You have the list there. You are going to get all those rotations in a hospital. Um, typically, you'd be working from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. on the wards um, during each rotation. Um, lectures for these rotations are incorporated at different times throughout the week. It's less heavy on lectures by the time you're in your clinical years. Um, because that was, you know, a lot of that was the chunk of your uh, foundation in the preclinical years when you were at the Elam campus. But in your clinical years, you have your lectures, but most of your learning is in the hospital with the patients, hands-on. Um, so that's the difference. And um, again, your on-call shifts are part of your, your structure, um, but the duration of the on-call shifts now increases with time so that by your sixth year you're doing a 24-hour on-call shift in the hospital um, covering whatever rotation that you're in at that time um, as a junior doctor not just not as a student as a junior doctor you have to you know supervise the students who are younger than you and you know you have to collaborate with the residents and the attendings to manage the patients that you've been assigned uh, typically that can be you know six to ten patients it depends on the ward that you're in um, the workload is different. Um, so on-call shifts are just, you know, an added tool to, you know, to help strengthen your skills before you end up graduating. And you continue to participate in the marches and research days and extracurricular activities uh, in your clinical years as you can, as you can fit them in. So how do U.S. citizens apply to ELAM? Number one, you have to be a U.S. citizen. You have to be a naturalized citizen or born here, um, but you have to have your citizenship. And you have to be between the ages of 18 to 25. There are exceptions um, over 25, but it's typically slightly over 25, but under 30 years old. That is that is um, a Cuban adjustment um, in our case, and it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, only because most of your comrades from other countries are very young. They're coming straight out of uh, high school um, starting and starting Elam. So most of our classmates are that age from 18 to 25. Um, in fact, most of our friends that we graduated with pretty much were graduating at the age of 24 from medical school, whereas we were older um, because we had, you know, entered the program after most of us having at least done maybe undergrad, but it's not a requirement. Um, so here with this program, you have to be a high school graduate um, and have a B proficiency um, in pre-med college level sciences being your full year of biology, full year of chemistry, full year of organic chemistry, and full year of physics, all with the lab components. Um, so you could be a high school graduate and then um, do your prerequisites um, and apply for this scholarship. You do not have to be a, a, a college graduate to apply for this scholarship. Um, you also should not have any outstanding criminal charges and you should be committed to practicing medicine in underserved U.S. communities. That is super important because as we know, this scholarship was offered to us because um, it was supposed to be targeted to um, youth that are from historically disadvantaged and marginalized communities. 
Um, and so even if, um, even if, you know, once you're done, the commitment is for us to return to our communities uh, within the U.S. Uh, that have suffered huge um, inaccess to healthcare, um, and so it's a it's a it's a social contract. It's not a written contract that you know this is what you're supposed to do. Not from the Cuban side anyway, but this is what they expect of us as U.S. students who are training in Cuba is that we will come back and fill the gaps that uh, exist here in this healthcare system. So this is a slide with a bit more detail about the curriculum um, that you have while you're there. Um, but I'm not going to go into great detail. I've already mentioned most of them. I think the, the part that's well broken down here is pre-med first year and second year. So you see the classes that you would be taking during that time. And sixth year also to emphasize, sixth year is an internship year. So you are a junior doctor. Your um, your rotations that you're repeating in six year are internal medicine, peds, ob gyn general surgery, and comprehensive general medicine, which is Medicina General Integral. So once you're done with six year, you do a, a final state, a national state exam, a practical and a theor theoretical exam that would then, um, when you pass, grant you the degree of uh, medicine. Um, dorm life, school life in general in, in Cuba is very, very much different from what you are used to in the United States. Um, you're in rooms of 10 to 12 people, uh, sharing five to six bunk beds. Uh, you hold your personal belongings in standard lockers, mostly sharing a locker with your bunk mate. Um, but I believe that has changed. You can have a full locker now. So that's an upgrade from the time that I was there. Um. <laughs> And uh, the larger portion of your personal belongings are kept in a safe room, which you have access to throughout the week. If you need additional items or to swap anything, you can go there and do that. Um, bathroom spaces are communal um, and dorms are gender based. Um, in terms of food, campus, you know, has a dining hall where breakfast, lunch and dinner is served. Dining hall meals are based around the staple beans and rice uh, with some offerings of veggies and root, vegetable, root vegetables based on the season. Um, everything in Cuba is based on the season um, and that's very different from what we're used to in the states where uh, we may have access to foods uh, all year round. That is not natural um, in any part of the world um, and <laughs> especially in Cuba. Um, so you get to, you know, you have peak moments where tomatoes in season and that's where you're going to have lots of tomatoes or cucumbers um, and other seasons where um, carrots are in season so you get to see how throughout the year vegetables and access to them change right and um, you add that to your diet and there are also independent food kiosks on campus and um, state owned and other private private owned restaurants that you can buy food from to supplement whatever you get from the the dining hall um so that's that's the food aspect which i think um uh, in our experience quite a few of us had um difficulty adjusting to but nothing you know nothing that will break you you can get through it um traveling is typically done throughout the breaks which the biggest break is the summer break summer break um, in July and August and so that is when you would be able to at least travel home um, if you can um, most of our comrades from other countries do not have that luxury of being so close to to Cuba they come from afar and you know money factor so quite a few of them stay the whole seven years in Cuba before returning home um, and then others too get to travel back to their countries based on the scholarships that their government gives them um, stipends to be able to travel maybe after three years um, of studying. So it's different, but US students are typically the ones who travel the most. Um, and it's either during those summer breaks or the short December break 
um, which is December 24th to January 2nd. Um, also, the school year has changed drastically because of COVID. Uh, the semester now starts in February. So um, those first 10 days that were available before are not so much 10 days. It's a very different different scheme, although they're available for taking exams, but um, they're available, available for taking exams, but not so much for traveling. Then we also have here, you know, what happens after Elam. Um, after Elam, once you graduate, you transition and, you know, you're supposed to fulfill your social contract. Baby, can you get down, please? Get down. I'm on the knee. Sorry for the interruption. Um, so we're... You're, you're supposed to fulfill your social contract. We have currently 209 U.S. ELAM graduates and 121 of them are working as attendants or residents in various cities across the U.S. Um, there's a journey to this thing, and it starts from day one. Um, it's a long journey, but it's a marathon. It's not a sprint race. Um, and once you get back here, it requires you getting certified as an international medical graduate, through an entity called the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates. Um, once you're certified, then you also um, you then you'll have access to do residency here. Um, but in order to get certified, you have to take these board exams, which are called the USMLE Step One and Step Two, um, Step Two CK. And these exams, in addition to uh, an additional clinical exam. Um, which is a new substitute for what was previously the Step 2 CS exam, uh, is, are the requirements and components for, for you to, to get certified. And we also have to do an English occupational exam um, as a requirement as well for certification, even though we are U.S. citizens and we speak English. Um, it's just one of those things that ECFMG has placed as a criteria. And of course, at the end, uh, you find out that yes, you can do it because there have been graduates who have made it through um, either while studying uh, simultaneously for the exams in Cuba and um, studying for their Cuban curriculum and studying for the USMLE exams or graduating and then doing it after the fact, like some of us. So yes, you can do it. Um, our graduates continue to make a name for us in different residency programs. Um, and it's just amazing that, you know, we are in right now, this week is what we call residency match week. Um, and we have had excellent news so far of graduates matching into residency programs. So, you know, the beautiful story continues. Um, Elam graduates um, continue to make impact and are making their place um, in different, in different um, residency programs, in different specialties, mainly uh, in family medicine, internal medicine, peds and ob the primary care specialties, but also we have graduates who have done neurology, triple board in peds, child psychiatry and, and psychiatry, um, uh, in adolescent psychiatry, uh, pulmonary and critical care, trauma and orthopedics. Um, we've had, you know, people who, you know what you want, you go get it, who are uh, doing surgery. So, um, Everybody has different trajectories, but the example and the the precedent has been set. So it's an amazing group to, to be a part of and supportive uh, in all ways because, you know, there's one thing that joins us, the fact that we all went through Cuba, Cuban training and we know that the Cuban training that we were offered um, adds a touch of humanity um, to our way of, of practicing medicine um, that is not so easy to find uh, being trained in the system. Um, so that concludes the presentation for today. Um, I've put contact info for myself and Miss Angie. Um, the email addresses you can reach us at with questions. Uh, and I'm gonna stop screen share. And I did not see any other questions in the chat, so. Don't worry, I've been keeping track. So 
um, let's go ahead and in the interest of time, jump right into those questions, I think, right? Um, one of the questions that was asked was uh, about student loan deferment. So if someone has student loans, but they start at Elam, how do, how do they do that? Can they defer their loans? Yeah, so um, with the loans that we had, uh, most of us reach out to whatever company it is that your loans were from and tell them that uh, you're going to school out of the country um, and that the school doesn't have a an ID, uh, a loan ID, like how other uh, offshore U.S. schools have, I mean, U.S. offshore schools, medical schools have. So because it's an international program that is not based on the U.S. loan program, you have to specify that to whoever your loan provider is. And then uh, they would probably put you on a, is it forbearance or a deferment plan or something um, based on your income being zero because you're a scholarship student, you're not going to have a job um, down there. You're not going to have income, so you can't contribute to making payments. So they put you on these um, plans of income-based plans based on zero zero dollar income. And then um, every year you have to renew it um, depending on which company it is. Um, until you are finished with the program or turn, get a job, and then you can pay them back. Great. Um, another question is about the uh, prerequisites and those requirements. Yes. And so um, should someone take general bio and two, um, and are there, sorry, are there any um, exceptions? So if there's like a, a combination course uh, in general chemistry and organic chemistry, um, can it count for partial credit for chemistry recs or is it on a case by case basis? So are there any exceptions or flexibility um, with the prerequisites? So generally we like to keep things as uniform as possible um, only because the, these requirements are not our requirements per se, but uh, part of the program. So yes, it should be as close to the general courses that we've listed. Um, but again, if your institution doesn't have it, if you can go to a local community college or any other institution to take that course, even better. Um, because then in the case of trying to correlate what it is, what is available at your school um, with the requirements that we have, you'd have to send us a course description um, and the page to the science departments for your school for us to be able to see you know the the sequences offered at your school and that's super time consuming if we're going to do that person by person um and we are a small team so <laughs> we want you to help us um so we can help you uh and so sticking to to the general um courses would be the best option i hope that answers the question uh great the next question is what is the household income limit needed there is no um, set household income limit um, created. We do have a chart that we go by that's a federal a federal chart um, giving us a breakdown of number of people in the household and the incomes. And we try to, to look at it based on, you know, cost of living in your respective states, plus um, just each individual situation because it's it's a lot more complicated than just putting your um, providing your tax returns and then us saying okay this you're financially disadvantaged or not um, so it's a it's it's a more of a holistic review than just a number cutoff or whatever yeah absolutely uh, the next question uh, would I be able to bring my spouse along no um, as part of the scholarship contract we cannot have uh, spouses live with us or children, our children live with us uh, in Cuba, they could visit you um, periodically while you're studying there, but they cannot live with you. Great. Um, another question. Um, can family members send packages to students? How does mail delivery function when you're living in the dorms? Yeah, um, <laughs> mail delivery. That's that's such a foreign idea when it comes to studying in Cuba. Um, 
don't just don't think about mail delivery in Cuba because you might mail something and it will show up the following year um, just because and that is based on the U.S. blockade. So for you all to really appreciate what it is you're getting into, you have to understand that you are going to Cuba, which is a country that is being sanctioned, blockaded by the United States in every sense of the word. Everything that you would normally get out here uh, with ease is 10 times difficult in Cuba. Um, and that is why most of us, before we leave, um, travel with quite a bit of things. Um, although, of course, airline have their restrictions um, in terms of luggage that you can carry, especially in these recent years, traveling to Cuba, most of the commercial flights only al allow you to take um, 250 pound bags. Um, but it makes us also very smart and intentional about what we need um, and leave behind what we don't need. Um, and then you get there and you try to adapt as much as you can with what there is on the island. Um, some of us initially took boats of, uh, what is it, soap down because we didn't know what the situation was. But then when we got there and we understood how things work, um, we were able to, you know, give and take Maybe it's not, you know, the quality of soap that you like or prefer, but that's what there is. And that's what you will live with if it means you not having to lug down 10 pounds of whatever soap you use. You know, you just become smarter about these things. Make choose, Pick and choose your battles. Um, but uh, in terms of, of getting things there, really, it, it really does depend on, on us traveling with our items. Or if you're lucky enough to have family or friends visit you, bring down stuff. Uh, for you. Great. Um, another question is, if I took accelerated courses in the required sciences, are those applicable to the scholarship? If you took accelerated courses um, in high school, is that the question? It doesn't say high school, so it might be a, um, James would be, it was James Bennett, his question, so. Um, James, if you'd like to clarify. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if you're trying to make sure you get your application before you turn 25, you might want to have a way to get make sure you can take have multiple times and you can take classes beforehand. There are certain colleges that offer like like you know five to ten week programs where you're rigorously going through the material and then you get college credit at the end. But those count for Elam. Thank you. Yes. Yes, as long as it's, I mean, it's a college level course, then it's fine. It doesn't really matter how long it took you to, to take them, right? Um, what matters is that you took it and you passed well. Does that answer Lots, your question? Yeah, it does. Lots of questions about studying for the STEP exam. Um, are there resource, resources provided and what does studying for the STEP look like? So we are going to, um, you all would be applying to an international medical school that is not geared to train you for the USMLE exams, right? It is geared to train you to be an internationalist physician, that you go where your your um, skills are needed to serve. Um, and so as US students, we take it upon ourselves to buy the supplemental resources that we need to study um, for the USMLE exams. But gratefully too, uh, we've been able to partner up with um, companies like Ambos recently that offer uh, a study plan on a scholarship for a study plan for uh, U.S. Elam students. So you have that under your tool as a as a resource to study from day one um, and incorporate that into your everyday plan. Um, and then we also have um, access to digital format of most of the the text, uh, most of the textbooks and study resources that you would need uh, on file for the delegation. So all of that is is within our reach and it's free and on the hard drives for the delegation uh, at both campuses, whether it's Enrique Cabrera for your clinical years or Elam uh, campus in the first preclinical years, you have access to those um, and you can download question banks, offline question banks that have been uh, put on there and so many things. Um, yeah, so many things. So I hope that answers um, the question. 
Yeah, can permanent residents travel to Cuba or only citizens? So permanent no, residents. anybody can travel to Cuba um, as long as you have a passport, right? Um, you can travel to Cuba whether you're a permanent resident or a citizen. Um, the issue is that this scholarship for you to study there is only granted to U.S. citizens, so not permanent residents with green cards. Um, it says, what if you graduated college but need to take required courses? Does it matter if you take them post-grad? Please repeat that. Um, does it matter if you take the prerequisites after you graduate, after you received your bachelor's? No, it does not matter. Uh, that's what some of us did. So yeah, because honestly and truly, there's quite a few of us in this program who took the long way around in general, um, in terms of our path to medicine because of the hurdles, the obstacles that most of us confront in the system, being told you can or cannot do such and such um, inadvertently leads to the fact that you end up taking a longer route to get to your, to fulfilling your dreams. So no, you are free to, you're totally free to take your prerequisites after you're taking your bachelor's. Okay. Um, are there visas family members could use to stay in Cuba while you are studying? Someone who could accompany you on a dependent visa, but has accommodation elsewhere. Uh-huh, this is a very particular question. <laughs> and who's asking this question? Um, James Bennett. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is no specific visa for family members. You would be using a tourist visa um, to, for them to, to visit you in, in Cuba. Um, for somebody who could accompany you on a dependent visa but has accommodations elsewhere. Um, don't think there's a dependent visa either, but again, the key here is that this program, because of its unique constraints uh, in a country that's uh, very resource poor um, and is granting us this gift of you know, studying there, the, the main reason why um, family spouses and children are excluded from being with you constantly in our countries because we then incur um, more expenses on a system that is already stretching itself to to offer us um, what it has some of what it has because cuba doesn't give us leftovers it shares what it has so you then go there on scholarship and then you're bringing your your family with you um that implies all sorts of things. The medical insurance that they're going to have to use to, to take care of them, living situation, the schools that they'd have to utilize, all of those things. So those are the main reasons why, unfortunately, we can't encourage people who have families uh, and main responsibilities, maybe uh, as a parent, um, to take their children down there because it's a, it would be a very crazy situation. That makes okay, complete and, sense. Yeah. And um, are you required to stay in the dorms? After this message in the chat, we're going to go to the people who have their hands raised. Um, yeah. And then if there are questions after this, I email either uh, Samira or myself, and we will um, get to those questions individually. Um, so Olivia, yes, you do need four reference letters. Um, so Jaden says, are you required to stay in the dorms during preclinical years? Are you allowed to seek other accommodations? Um, yeah, part of the, the student contract, your scholarship contract is that you should stay uh, at the dorms um, throughout, not just during your preclinical years, throughout your education. Um, and whether you're allowed to seek other accommodations are, is not a question that I can, I can, um, respond to because the contract is that you should as a student as a scholarship student stay on the dorms um it's about safety it's about um also building community with the folks that you go to school with um there's a reason why the setup is the way it is uh at elam uh it may not be convenient for most of us who are uh, accustomed to luxury living uh and independent living but it forces us to grow in multiple ways uh, by living with people. Um, so, yes, it's part of it's all part of the educational um, 
plan. Experience, yeah. Um, so we're gonna go to Fernando. Go ahead. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Samira, for the great presentation. I, I, I'm impressed with your <laughs> with your knowledge about Cuba. Believe me, I'm I'm impressed. Uh, and thank you, you for the great presentation that you did. My, uh, my general question is about what is the extra cost for a student? I'm trying to um, looking for a student in, in, in my city that wanted to pursue a medical uh, degree in Cuba, no? What would be the extra cost for them outside the, the scholarship? Yes, thank you so much uh, for joining us, Fernando. Uh, it's an honor to have you on this call and um, that is a very important question because yes, while this is a free scholarship that offers you uh, free tuition and lodging and books and uh, school uniforms and different resources uh, from the Cuban government, you do have to save up money uh, to, to be able to live um, through the, the seven year period. And typically we recommend people to have uh, at least $15,000 saved that would last you the seven years okay so the seven years fifteen thousand dollars is what we recommend people to have saved and if you don't have all of that you know saved up we understand because we are all people who came from limited means we know that that is not easily accessible to many of us but again you can imagine that roughly you need about um what two thousand dollars a year um and that would cover your ticket for traveling back and forth home, um, any personal expenses, spending money that you may need down there, um, like you wanna buy extra food from restaurants and things and um, essentials, but also maybe emergency needs. So $2,000 a year um, roughly in, in Cuba should help you as a student because um, you live, you know, within your means. You don't do extravagant things, and you'll be able to to manage on that on that amount of money. That's what I did. Um, so, and you're here. Mm. <laughs> let me let me let me take in a couple of minutes and chat this with all the students. And it will be a very challenging go to Cuba and adapting to the Cuban situation. Uh, Cuban, you have to think in the Cuban is a poor country. Um, uh, you know, we know, uh, over there we don't have too many things that you enjoy in this country and have it and get it for granted. We don't have it over there. But what I'm can telling you for sure is you go with the decided to be a doctor and you follow all the instructions that this particular um, uh, scholarship offered to you and also you follow the whole instruction that the school and uh, uh, regulation that the school has and the doctor that is gonna be your teacher, believe me, you are gonna be a great, great doctor. And the most important thing is now is you become a doctor. The most important thing you are to become a human doctor. That is the difference between our medicine in Cuba and the medicine that is practicing in the United States and it's needed. It's really needed. So thank you so much for inviting me and, and for me to you. And we are getting in touch, for sure. <laughs> for Thank sure, you. for sure. Thank you. OK. Uh, Thank you, Fernando. Um, Omari Lyles, go ahead. Dr. Samira, thank you again for the beautiful presentation. It was very clear and thorough. Um, thank you as well, Angie, um, for this opportunity to be in this meeting. Um, I had two questions in regard to the program. Um, I am, a, I'm in my last year of undergrad and um, I'll be finishing, uh, I'll be finishing next spring. Um, so I'm pretty much almost done with all of my courses and requirements. My mentor is uh, Dr. Desta Valdez. She graduated class of 2008. Um, she's been kind of walking me through uh, this, this process. Um, but I had two questions in regards to the, the uh, GPA, the grades for the classes, and then also for the uh, medical licensing here. So I'll just start with 
the grading. So from my understanding, it's a B, uh, a B minus. Is that a B minus for every single course or is it the B minus average for all of the courses together? The average for, for your, your, what is it? Your prereq courses. Okay. So not, so, not your entire uh, college career, just focusing on your science prereqs that you needed for the program. Right. So it's like a, it's like a, like the core, the core science class average. Okay. That's right. That's right. Okay. All right. And then as far as um, studying for the US MLE um, exams, um, the information that we're learning on the campus should put us in a, a decent enough position to prepare for those exams as, on top of getting the, the textbooks to practice for that, correct? That's right. Um, our Cuban training lays a critical foundation for us to be able to then um, study as well um, through English resources, uh, English language resources to prepare for the USMLE exams. And it's great that you have um, Dr. Desta as your mentor because she's done it. Um, and I'm sure she told you her own personal story. Um, I remember when she came down to visit us one random day uh, uh, to the dorms and it was it was just good to see you know uh, an elam grad who has gone through it um made it and then comes back to cuba and says hey let me just go to campus and check on the u.s students to see how they're doing she doesn't know us from anywhere she never <laughs> she never heard of us uh, but that's that's the sort of family and uh, support system that you build and so yeah your cuban training it lays such a foundation that I would even say, I mean, you can't get anything like that in the United States. Being in a hospital setting from day one, for most of us who have, you know, been in hospital settings, maybe because, you know, we were volunteering or, um, yeah, volunteering mostly or working as maybe a nursing aide or some kind of tech or something in a hospital, but not have the ability to work with patients, to, to touch patients, for them to have, to give you their consent from the moment they walk in and they see you and they trust you with um, their health, that's unparalleled. You don't find that anywhere else in the world because unfortunately we live in a, in a system where um, lawsuits, liabilities are the, the talk of the, the, the land, you know, and so it just holds us back in terms of our capacity to learn. And so there's nothing that can beat that hands-on training, uh, but the foundation in terms of basic medical sciences is there. Um, and everyone who studied in Cuba would tell you that any person who studies medicine has to be personally driven. It's not just what the system gives you, but you also have to sit yourself down, be focused and do extra studying all the time, not just while you're in preclinical years or just in clinical years for your whole entire life because you're going to be you have to stay on top of on top of things and because science changes every day so um yeah we have an incredible foundation uh based on what we learn in cuba thank you so much i really appreciate that information welcome uh luisa sanchez go ahead Hi, Dr. Adre. Thank you for your info. It's really helpful just to review all these questions. Um, I just had a question about the FMGE, like from the medical students, foreign medical students. Um, so the process before we transition back to the US is to first start with passing step one and step two. For those, do they, um, integrate a time where U.S. students can take that if we want to do it during our studies in Cuba instead of waiting for after graduation? Yeah, so the, the school doesn't set a time necessarily for us to do that, but within the U.S. delegation, we've had, we have a step committee, um, which is led by students, your peers, um, and it's been there from the first classes graduating until now, where what um, grads found was the optimal time for you to take step one was after your second or third year um, in the program. And then step two CK uh, advisably would be after your 
fourth or fifth year because based on the, ro the rotations that you are you have taken by then because step two ck is clinical knowledge so of course you would be able to build on um anything that you have touched and seen and and heard in a in a ward um when you study after that or when you study concurrently and then you take that exam if you understand what i'm saying um so there's no there's no fixed time just to, to answer the question there's no fixed time um that is proposed by the school it's just based on guidance and experiences of fellow students and grads uh, about when the best time is for you to to attempt those exams um and again the push is for us to get it done as much as possible while we're there but we all know that life happens too and sometimes you're not able to do that but you keep going you know and and you give yourself that grace because um it is a lot i understand and if you're doing it within the semesters is it do you just schedule it like if you're a u.s student do you just schedule it in between your semesters or can you take it in cuba yeah so the ideal thing is that you always have to you well number one you cannot take the usmle in cuba unfortunately um cuba is not a location where you could take the usmle and it's because of the blockade um <laughs> mind you but um you would have to come home and typically it's been done in our summer uh, uh, summer vacation. So July, August is when most of us take these exams uh, while we're there. Um, and if you have a possibility of taking it at another point in the year would be the one week break in April, um, which is, uh, it's like the third week of April every school year, but sometimes that changes. Um, but typically it's always the summer breaks. And then the, the faculties know that if you're taking your exam, you may need a few extra days um, into the summer before you return because of the exam. Um, because what typically has happened in the past is that people prep, prep throughout the school year, and then the summertime they do the intensive study. And so once you're taking your your um, practice test, practice test throughout the summer to see, you know, how well you're going to pass you get to a point where maybe you need extra a few extra days to actually, you know, hit the mark that you want or whatever it is. But the school then has to know beforehand that you need those extra days so that it can be authorized for you to come back um, a few days late. But it's typically something that we encourage people to do during the summer, just so you're not you're not caught between uh, missing too many days from your classwork and stuff, um, because our, our schedule is different in the Cuban side. Um, and we also don't want to create a situation of exceptionalism for US students. Um, we're there as as you know, guests. And so we try to fit in as much as possible based on what we have been afforded. So the best time is for for you to take those exams during the summertime so that you don't jeopardize anything else that you're learning uh, in Cuba. Okay, great. Um, and then for the after passing the USMLE, um, you do have to take it within like a few years of graduating ELAM if you decide to do it after? No, there, there are specific rules with the ECFMG. For example, if you've taken the first exam, then your subsequent exam needs to be done within seven years uh, of that first one, right? So um, if you've never taken any of them, then you're fine, you have some time to, to make them up. But if you have taken that first one, you have up to seven years before you take, um, you can take the second one and and then that's that's it. So there is a timeline and specific details. That's all in ECFMG um, website. And um, hopefully that doesn't change because that's those are details that have unfortunately also changed throughout the period that um, we've been studying there. Um, and also now different criteria for certification haven't changed due to the pandemic. So it's a ongoing thing. And those are details that you, you pull out um, as you're in the process, if you understand yeah, what I'm saying. I know it is a lot. I just like, I'm thinking about all of this while I'm applying. And even with like the um, certification for foreign medical students, I'm wondering if that like a separate exam that teaches your knowledge or teaches your 
Like, what are they certifying you on? Is it an exam that they're just trying to review what courses you took or are they no, trying to test? The certification is the culmination of you having met those criteria, having taken the step one and step two CK and your English occupational exam. Um, it's all to see if your, your knowledge base parallels with what the U.S. system deems acceptable as a medically trained professional. Um, but it's very specific, you know, because everybody is, is um, taking this exam, whether they studied in the U.S. or not. But the difference is that we are not being, we're not being trained or prepared towards the exam, whereas our U.S. counterparts are being trained and prepared towards the exam. That's where the disadvantage comes in, right? So you have to be somebody who has the mindset that you know that this is the hurdle, but you're willing to work through it and work past it um, and do the double, triple work that's required. Um, so okay, I hope I that see. answered your question. It did. It did. It's not like an additional um, medical no. exam. Your, your certification comes after you finish those steps. Then they say, okay, you've you checked off all these steps, so you're now ECFMG certified. You can now apply to residency programs or uh, residency programs in the United States. Okay, and then this is just my one. I know you have to get going. You said that there was like 200 graduates and then 121 are working in the field. Is it because of obstacles that they've met with residency or would you know? Um, no, it is not because of obstacles that we don't have a 100% or 100% match rate. Um, it is because um, the obstacle is that we are people from disadvantaged backgrounds. We come with a lot of layers of disadvantages. And so when people come out of the program, some people have even lost their support system. Uh, they have to reinsert themselves back uh, in by working and supporting themselves and doing all sorts of things or taking care of elderly parents and additional things that people don't look at or care about when they're looking at a, a human being. But that's a factor for a lot of us um, as to why we are able to either take the exams or not, or when we're able to take the exams, uh, et cetera. We're also people who go into the program at relatively older ages. So there's also the life factor of Oh, you want to get married, you want to start a family, all of those things happen maybe during or after you've um, finished the program, which also prolongs your your situation. So it's a myriad of factors as to why the numbers are the way they are. Um, but I've seen everything, you know, people who graduated from the first class uh, having matched like last year. And that's a huge gap in terms of when you graduated and when you it started residency, but that person did it. Mm -hmm. um, so anything is possible. Um, and again, this is a group of people who are amazing in and, of, in and of itself, just because it's, Elam grads are special people. We come with, you know, our unique features and we're able to push through a lot of things to get what we want. Um, and there's also people who after studying medicine, maybe very small percentage decide that this is not the path for me um, or people who study and decide they don't want to do residency because it's very very stressful um, and they don't have the capacity for it so they insert themselves in the health system in a different way um, in order to support people um, or support more grads etc et so there's different stories okay does ifco have resources to connect to residencies for the U.S. students? I think we should. Yes, IFCO is, is building those resources um, to keep uh, Elam grads supported um, in the transitional period. There are other organizations too that help in that aspect. Um, one is Medic. Another one is the Elam Graduate Student Fund. There are, there are many friends of Elam grads who plug in whatever resources they have personally or organizationally to help people place in residencies. And again, the fact that people resident, um, Elam grads have already been in residency programs has also built the reputation of Elam graduates and built a natural network of, of places that we apply to typically uh, when we come back, because we know that those programs know about 
our, our training, know about what we can offer. And so the chances of us um, matching in those programs are higher uh, than some others, but there's lots of work to do. And this is, um, this is a program that's 20 years young. Uh, we've only had graduates for 14 years. Uh, we're continually building the infrastructure for this whole thing. So this is not something that is, was pre-made and set for us to dive in and, and um, enjoy and reap the benefits. We've had to build. That's why you have people like me, a recent grad, working with IFCO and contributing in a different way because that legacy has to continue. There has to be different people doing different things to build the infrastructure that will then support more youths from disadvantaged backgrounds to get this Cuban training and to to um, get what our communities really need, the type of care and physicians that our communities really need. But it's it's all hands on deck and it's it's a never ending project. We're, we're still on it. So um, I would love to talk to you more about that um, or any other questions you have separately, just so we don't uh, dominate the conversation and question and answer period. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your advice. You're welcome. And then Benson. Thank you, Benson, for being so patient. Benson, did he leave us? Uh-huh. He's writing in the chat. I'm here. Okay. You you I'm from Ghana, so the time difference actually varies. Um, I just complete, I just graduated from uh, my undergrad level in chemistry. Uh, I actually was going through the website and I saw uh, LM. So I thought I could apply to, I really want to apply to a medical school. Okay. So I wanted to find out if I'm, I could still use my undergrad certificate to apply to a medical school in, um, in, in Cuba. In Cuba. And if yes, what is actually the requirements? Because I didn't really get it clear from the website. Okay. So thank you, Benson, for joining us. Um, uh, good to see a fellow countryman uh, from Ghana. Uh, always, this, I'm sure you feel like uh, out of place in this call because this conversation has been centered on US citizens going to- Exactly, to Elon. exactly. But uh, in the case of Ghanaians who want to study in Cuba, you have to go to the Cuban embassy in Ghana. Um, I believe they're very active on social media. So I would, I would look them up uh, either on Twitter or some other, um, mostly Twitter, they're very active so that you can have some direct communication with somebody who's working at the Cuban embassy in Ghana um, and tell them that you have interest in applying. So if there are scholarships being offered this year, uh, then you can have access to that. They will give you the steps because it's done through the scholarship secretariat in Ghana and uh, the Ministry of Health. So, um, but it's all coordinated uh, along with the Cuban embassy in Ghana. So you have to make contact with them for them to tell you specific requirements and steps. Okay. All right. Sure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Th um, yes. This applies for anybody from any other country um, outside of the U.S. Unfortunately, IFCO cannot facilitate uh, scholarships for everyone. We would love to, but we cannot. Um, and the standard protocol for other countries applying um, to Elam is based on the diplomatic relations that that country has with Cuba. So if your country has diplomatic relations and has an embassy uh, or maybe a, a consulate or a diplomatic representative of Cuba in your country, you need to approach them um, reach out to them and get information about how to apply to Elam. Um, that's how you would be able to apply. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And then we're going to finish it out with uh, Fernando. And, uh, and just for clarification, I took the, the requirement is uh, chemistry, general um, biology, one, two, anatomy, physiology, and pharmacology. No, the no anatomy and physiology. General chemistry. Okay. And then organic chemistry. Okay. Physics. Okay. And then biology. Okay. Let me. Okay. No, no pharmacology. 
No, no, you learn pharmacology in, in Cuba. <laughs> no physiology. Okay. And the second question in that direction, they need to learn in Spanish here or Spanish is going to be learning on the school? They are going to teach them Spanish in the school. It, uh, it's like, it's good if you have some, some idea of Spanish, but again, Spanish um, for your professional career, it is better for you to go through the the language course that the teachers have in, in, in Alam because they're specially trained to help us um, learn this language in a short period of time. And not only that, um, Cuban Spanish is very special, very different. Um, so the <laughs> rhythm is fast. <laughs> the, the words that are used will catch you off guard. So you need the time to get used to all of those things. And it's best for you to either start trying to, you know, listen to Cuban music or different things or watch, you know, telenovelas that are Cuban to get uh, an ear to the, the, the accent or you wait until you get to Cuba and you are in there and all you have to do is study Spanish and you can focus on that. And because it's the only way you'll be able to communicate, you will, <laughs> you will learn. I ask you all of those questions because my idea here is I'm going to start working on how I present the, the, the project to the school uh, system. Uh, my idea is finding that um, the African-American Caucasus in our legislator uh, uh, requesting some funds for this kind of student and helping with your uh, you know, you got a scholarship, but this one is it's gonna be something personal, no? Because yeah. most of the this student, believe me, doesn't have this amount of money. Of money. You know, uh, but they if they wanted to pursue a, a medical degree in Cuba, we uh, we are looking for that opportunity to help you. And I wanted to ask the clear picture. This is what I asked in that question. But thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so happy. No, no thank you. <laughs> thank you. We need more community um, supported doctors uh, in this program. And we think it's very important that uh, whoever it is uh, w that applies to this program has not only the family network support system, but the community support that knows that you know you are going out there to become a physician become a revolutionary doctor to come back and help your own people help your own community that matters a lot so um we think it is terrific that you are taking this on as a project for the folks in louisiana um and we look forward to seeing that cadre of louisiana uh physicians cuban trained physicians I have a couple of doctors from Cuba here in working in the Neolian area. Do you know both or do you know something about it? Humboldt? No, we we have a couple of doctors graduate in Elan working in Louisiana next to Neolian, in Neolian area. Oh. But I'm not sure. Do you have the contact info? Do you know anything about it? Yeah, I know a couple of people who are who are at Tulane, so we can we can exchange that information later. Good. Please do that. About to use her both as a reference for the for the student. Oh, okay, excellent. We will we'll, we'll definitely do that. So I think that brings us to a close, right? Sure does. Thank you all for staying and being so patient um, throughout this program. Excellent questions, um, very detailed, some of them, but we see that you all are go-getters. You come, you know, with a vision and a mission to get through. So this is, this is beautiful. And I look forward uh, to you all applying and spreading the word um, and teach other people what you have learned today, because it's important for us to, to continue to educate um, our friends and family about Cuba and what it has to offer, not only health-wise, but in this particular gift of a an international school that is training uh, doctors of science and conscience for the world. So please spread the word.